Hey everybody, it's Pastor Dylan, and welcome to the Dayspring Wesleyan Church Podcast. At the end of this episode, please take the time to download our church app. It's the best way to stay connected to the life of the church. All you have to do is go to the App Store, search for Church Center, download and enter the information for our church. You will then be connected to our church community. I hope the following presentation inspires you to move closer to God in this journey we call faith. Enjoy. A great day to be here, huh? So he is risen. Amen. Amen. So we had a great Good Friday service for those of you who are able to attend. If you're not able to, that's going to be online. But we're so excited with what God's been doing in the midst of our church. And I'm really excited about everybody being here uh, today in person. And then we have several people that are online as well, even some in the prison system today that will be hearing this message. And so what a great gift we have to offer to our community. And what a great God that we serve. A God that took that somebody that was dead and brought him back to life, in which you and I can have the celebration as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. So uh, last week we did our Easter love offering, and we put online that uh, uh, we had a goal of 100000 and uh, last, last week uh, you took in more than $225,000 and stuff. So amen, amen. So we know that some of that would be going to debt, but we have a large majority of it going to different missions and works and stuff around the community and around the world as well. So thank you for your giving. But I also want to invite Christine up at this time. Uh, Christine is uh, from Kindway Ministries, and it's a uh, group that supports the work of, of uh, 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 basically caring for inmates as they come out and get back into the, um, get back into the public. And uh, Christine is part of that. But she was also the warden at MCI, I believe, right? And that she was the warden when Stan was in uh, the prison system. So she saw firsthand what was taking place in his life. And because of your giving last week, we're able to give them a check for $5,000. And so we want to make sure you have that for that. So thank you. So what impresses me about the Easter story, and if you look at the Bible as a whole, one of the things you need to know is this, is that the disciples were walking with Jesus and they had one vision of how things were going to go. And things got um, sort of turned around pretty quick. When he was arrested, they didn't think that was the way things were going down. And especially when they saw him on a cross and even when he died, even though he predicted all these things and he said he would rise again in three days, the disciples went into hiding. They were afraid for their lives. But then Jesus rose on that morning. The women went to the tomb, and there was two of them because it was part of the culture that you needed two witnesses to prove that anything was real. And the women were at the tomb. They had an encounter with the angels. Then they had an encounter with Jesus. And then they went back and told the disciples what had happened. And the disciples didn't even believe it until they, too, had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And when they had that encounter, they were eyewitnesses to both his death and his resurrection. And then they went out and they shared the gospel with everybody that they came in contact with. Hey, church, listen, you and I have been witnesses to that as well. And we have a message to proclaim, that we were all dead in sin and that we came alive in Christ. Today, we wanted to do something different because we knew of the people that would be here in attendance. We knew that people have been in some pretty low places in life and just wonder, can I ever get out? Can I ever be forgiven? And so today, we have an eyewitness today, a man that was in the prison system and found Jesus. And Jesus not only freed him once, but he freed him twice. And so now that we get to hear his eyewitness testimony here today. So I want to introduce to you Stan Stever, who's going to be with us today, and he'll be sharing his testimony. So would you welcome Stan with me this morning? Thank you. Thank you. So today, as we uh, were getting into this, Stan and I, we had some, several conversations, and I listened to some of your videos as well. And I have to tell you before I get started that the thing that impressed me about you was the humility in which you shared your story and this brokenness and the, and the tears that were shed and the hugs that we gave one another. And I thought, this guy was in prison, you know? And so um, I think for most people, they probably want to know, you know, what, what, you know, what was your childhood like to when did you uh, end up in prison and, and what for? Well, I was, um, I grew up just maybe 30 miles north of here, a little town called Sycamore. Um, had six sisters and a brother, uh, had your average home, uh, but I was the youngest. I was the youngest, so I kind of, I got lost in, in the bustle of a large family. So I, 
I grew up without any direction. I grew up without any kind of identity for myself. In that, I was trying to find an identity. And uh, most of you know, if, if you don't have an identity, then what you try and do, you try and forget about you and become somebody else. And that's what the drugs and the alcohol did for me. When, when I first started doing that, um, that was probably 13 years old. Uh, I started doing, drinking and doing drugs. Um, fast forward to the age of 17. Um, I was angry. I had been bullied a lot in school. Um, there was a lot of man, rage and anger in me. Uh, as a child in the 70s, I didn't know, early 80s, I didn't know what bullying was. I didn't, you, you didn't hear about counseling. You didn't know about, I, I didn't know any of that. So I had no release. I had nothing to be able to release that anger and that rage that was inside of me. Um, and... Uh, Please know that, that I wasn't born a murderer. I wasn't born someone that was going to take someone's life, but it happened. And there's nothing I can do to take that back. There's nothing, there's not enough works in the world for me to take that back. And the only forgiveness that I have is through, the Christ, through Christ Jesus and what he's given me. That act, that decision I made that day, um, I became incarcerated at the age of 17. Um, going into prison as a child is, um, I can't explain it to you. I can't put it into words. Uh, if you can think of, uh, if you've ever been in a car accident or a near car accident or almost fallen off of something or had that real, that pit of fear in your stomach for that instant, for that one little instant, if you can think about that, that's what I had for about three years. Mm. I had that fear in me for that, for that long. Mm. I didn't know how to survive, so I was in survival mode, learning. I became more angry, more vengeful, more violent. Uh, when I went into prison, like I said, I was a child. And uh, if you can think of the darkest people, the worst of the worst, the, the deranged, the defiled, the, the, the darkest, the darkest people, that's, that's who I went into, into that adult prison. Now, uh, when I first came into prison, um, I had my belongings stolen. I had, uh, I was attacked a few times. I was, um, I was sexually assaulted. And uh, I didn't know who I was still. I still had no identity. So I, I aligned myself with some people that that were as, you know, as like me as possible. And uh, they, were, they were part of the Aryan Brotherhood. So I became part of the Aryan Brotherhood at a, at a young age. I was probably 21 at that time. Um, it, it stopped the violence against me. It stopped uh, everybody trying to take advantage of me. And they become like my family, Pastor. They, it, was, it was real easy to, to be part of it because no one else um, cared about me. And that's what it felt like. My family had kind of, uh, they were done with me. Uh, my mom stayed by my side, but later on I would find out she was scared to death of me. Uh, because of that anger and that, that rage that was inside of me. That would go on for, for many years. I would, uh, I would rise up in the ranks of the Aryan Brotherhood and uh, uh, violence, uh, that's how you got respect at that mm -hmm. point. Um, in doing that, I finally, I, I came across a guy that, that was like-minded with me and, and he was older than me and he had been living the life that I wanted longer. 
Um, when you looked into his eyes, he had volcanoes. That's how much rage he had in him. And when he walked into a room uh, and everybody just looked at him, uh, you know, we called him Shorty Hitler. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the kind of guy he was. Um, we, we, we did a lot in that institution together, along with the other brothers that were alongside of us. And at one point, he went through a program called Kairos. I had no idea what it was, but uh, uh, he did. And he went through it, um, ended up giving his life to Christ on that weekend. And it was on that weekend that, uh, just like the decision I made that changed so many lives, the decision he made also changed a bunch of people's lives. Uh, he called us into, uh, into a, a group meeting, you know, the Aryan Brother meeting. Uh, we called it church, actually. And uh, he got up in front of us, and he looked at us, and he said, I'm done. And I looked at him, and I said, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't go down like that. It doesn't happen like that. See, in a gang, it's blood in, blood out. You have to shed blood to get into the gang, and your blood must be shed for you to get out of that gang. And uh, it's all in the blood, isn't it? And uh, I stood up, I looked at him, and, and he was like a father figure to me. I, I lost my dad in 1988, about a year after I was incarcerated. So I had no father figure. I had nothing in my life, and, and he was it. And I looked at him, and I just said, you know, it doesn't happen like that. And I turned my back on him. And, and in prison, it's kind of the, that's the biggest insult you can give somebody is, is turn your back on them. Because what you're saying is, is I'm not scared of you. You're not going to do nothing to me. You're a coward. And uh, he took it. Um, about a month later, I ended up going to the hole, which is uh, solitary confinement uh, for probably my fifth uh, dirty urine, which is uh, 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 for drugs and drugs or alcohol. And I was, in, I was in the hole and my mom came to visit me. I haven't seen her for, I don't know, it had, it had been a couple years. Uh, they come and get me and, and when you're in solitary confinement, you have to wear a belly chain and handcuffs. So you can't move. There's, there's nothing. You can't get out of it. There's nothing you can do. And uh, so they take me out on a visit. I look at my mom, and as I'm walking towards her, I, I see a tear in her eye. And I get mad. I get mad because I think she's starting to pity me. I think, I think she feels sorry for me. And, and, man, I'm not one that wants to be pitied. I don't want that. I don't need that. So I kind of get mad and, and kind of yank on my belly chain and my, and my handcuffs. And, and I tell her, Mom, don't cry for me. I'm fine. I'm doing great. I said, this stuff is nothing. I can do this standing on my head, Mom. These people will never break me. And she just shakes her head. And she looks at me and she says, Stanley, when are you going to grow up? And it, it was a shot to my pride. Um, because I, and I told her, I said, Mom, what do you mean? I'm doing life in prison, helping run one of the most notorious gangs in prison. I, I, people are paying me money. What more do you want? And she said, Stanley, you're doing the same thing you were doing when you were 13 years old. You're rebelling against authority. You're doing drugs. You're fighting. You're, everything you're doing now you were doing at the age of 13. She said, what's different? And I got mad. I was mad. And I said, Mom, let me get a sandwich. And she went up, got me a sandwich. I ate it. I was out there for about a half hour. I went back to my cell. And uh, you're by yourself back there, solitary confinement. There's nothing around. All you hear is screaming and pounding on doors and and. There's a bunch of chaos around you, but there's nothing specifically around you. And I'm sitting in there, and, and the question keeps coming back to me, how can I prove I'm grown? 
How can I prove that I'm a man now? What's different? What's different? And I would get, and I got madder and madder, and 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 there was only one thing that I could could come up with that was different than when I was 13 years old. I was in prison. That was the only difference. And in, and God used that. God God knows exactly where we're at. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're going through. He knows what's in your heart. He knows the effects that you're having on people. He knows the effects they're having on you. And he sat me aside, sat me down, and posed that question to me through my mom to start that opening of my heart. I would, I would get out of uh, solitary confinement. Um, and uh, the guy's name's J.B., uh, Shorty Hitler, we called him JB also, and, and JB kept getting on me, you need to go through Kairos, you need to go through Kairos, and I said, no, get away from me. He finally asked me, he said, listen, you need to go through Kairos, just go through Kairos, I'll leave you alone after that. I'm like, okay, if you give me your word, you'll leave me alone, I'll go through Kairos. So I agreed, I, I the Thursday, it's a, Kairos is a Thursday through a Sunday uh, Christian retreat for uh, inmates inside of the prison. I go Thursday, um, now I'm, I'm still a heathen, I'm still, I don't know God, I'm, I think I'm God at that point. And uh, I go high, I, I smoke some weed, uh, I've heard of all the cookies and all the punch and the coffee they had. So I go high and, and I eat a bunch of cookies and the cookies were good and the, the coffee was good, the punch was good and, and I get up and I, and I leave and, and JB's outside of the chapel at that point when I walk out into the hallway and he says, how'd you, how'd you like it? I said, man, the cookies were awesome. <laughs> he, he said, man, tomorrow's going to be even better and I said, I'm not going back. I'm not going back, JB. I went. You asked me to go, I went. You said you'd leave me alone, now leave me alone. And I left, and I walked away from him. And, and uh, he had no idea um, what was going on in my mind. I just wanted to go back and get high again and, and just continue with my life, my life incarceration. Um, about 9 o'clock that evening, I get a phone call. The CO comes to my cell door and says, hey, you have a phone call. And, and I kind of looked at him. Inmates don't get phone calls, just so you know. Um, I looked at him and I said, no, I don't have a phone call. And he said, yes, you do. He said, you need to come down and get on the phone. I said, I'm not getting on the phone. He said, if you don't get on the phone, you're going to the hole. You're going to solitary confinement. And I'm like, man, I have illegal substances in my cell. I don't want them to find it. So I reluctantly go down and get on the phone. And, and uh, the only people that get on the phones at that point, I thought in my heart, were snitches and the police. And I wasn't either one of them. And I, I felt like everybody was looking at me. And I pick up the phone and, and I'm like, hello. And it was the, it was the warden. And uh, she says, uh, you see her, Christine Money, she was, she, she's my boss now. Um, <laughs> she says, listen, I heard you're not going back. Now, this is 9 o'clock at night. Everybody had been gone. There was nobody around. I hadn't told anybody but JB that I wasn't going back. And I'm like, how did you know that? And she said, well, it doesn't matter. She said, I, I, I really want you to go back. And I said, I'm not going back. And she said, I would count it as a personal favor if you would go back. And um, I don't know of any inmate in the world that wouldn't want a personal favor from a warden. So I, I, I reluctantly accepted because I wanted a personal favor of a warden. <laughs> I went back, um, went back Friday. I uh, went back high, I was high, I went in, not really wanting to get anything out of it, not thinking I could get anything out of it, thought I was just wasting my time. Um, went back Saturday, and at the end of each night, they give you brown bags of cookies. 
And uh, they call them forgiveness cookies. Well, on Saturday, they give you two brown bags of cookies. Well, right before they give you the cookies, they have a talk called a forgiveness talk. And uh, a brother by the name of Randy Rich gave that talk. And, and um, he was a, a deputy sheriff for the Franklin County um, Columbus Police Station. Uh, his, he, he told of his father being a deputy sheriff. He pulled a guy over. Uh, the guy wrestled with him on the side of a road, took his gun from him, and shot him. And he stood up in front of us and looked at each one of us in the eye, and he said, I forgive that guy. And inside, I'm like, no, you don't, man. Come on. You don't forgive him. And he just goes on how God had worked in his life, how at first he just hated that guy and he wanted that guy to die and, and everything that was about that. And, and he had so much vengeance and, and how his family was getting torn apart because of, because of the ugliness that was part of that unforgiveness. And he, he felt like he looked straight at me. He felt like he looked straight at me. And he said, you're forgiven too. And it pierced me. I didn't realize how much I wanted forgiveness for the life I took. I didn't know I needed it. In the darkness, you don't see a lot. You don't care about anything. And God used Randy to open my eyes to the garbage that was going on in my heart and everything that was piled up on top of it. And at the end of the night, they give you two bags of cookies, and he, and he made a challenge to each one of us. He said, one of those brown bags of cookies, I, I want you to give it to a guy that, that you hate. Give it to a guy that you, you, there's no way you could forgive this one person. That one person that just the, the sound of their voice. And right away I had a guy. I knew who it was. Um, Monday after the weekend, I was supposed to um, put my hands on a guy, harm a guy, and put him in the hospital, if not, if not take his life. And that's the guy I was going to give the bag of cookies to. I... Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to have to do it. I didn't, I, that was what you did for family, and that's what I thought the Aryan Brotherhood was for me, was family. So I left that night. I, I went to his dorm, his dormitory where he lived. I, I caught a guy going inside to the dorm, and I handed him the bag of cookies, and I said, give this to Jack. He was like, oh, Cairo's cookies. He said, can I have some? I said, no. <laughs> I said, I need him to go to Jack, and if he doesn't get every one of them, I'll be to see you. Now, I'm a heathen now. Don't forget that aspect of this. Um, so he gets the cookies, and I, I don't think anything about it. I'm like, I go back to my cell and, and lay down in my bed, and all this stuff's going through my head. Forgiveness, how I could be forgiven, how all the garbage that I've done in my life can be let go, that it doesn't have to weigh me down anymore, that he gives release and he gives peace. That his burden is lighter than ours. I go back that Sunday and, and uh, they give a couple more talks and I end up, uh, we go to what they call the officer's dining room and and we kind of circle up as a small group and Jim Driscoll comes behind me and, and kind of leans down and he says, they might die for you, but he already died for you. And I lose it. I lose it. I, 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 you don't show emotion in prison. I get up and I go around to the back where no one's around. It's right in front of the bathroom door and I fall to my knees. I don't know what's going on. I am so confused. I have no idea. 
And Jim Driscoll, 70 some years old, gets down on his knees with me and he explains to me about the spirit and how it's peeling away that, those, those scales from my heart and that hardness that, that the enemy wanted in us. And, and, and he right there on October 31st, 1999, led me to Christ. Mm. And it was a, it was an, it, I went from, I went from being a, a, a gang banging, drunken, dope smoking, gambling, violent heathen to a gang banging, drunken, dope smoking, violent Christian. <laughs> Nothing changed yeah. until he started putting disciples in my life, until he started putting people in my life that would explain to me what would go on, explain to me through me coming to Christ, through Kairos and Kairos outside and torch, my mom came to Christ and our relationship was, was mended. Uh, through that, she told me about the daughter of, of the lady that I, that I had taken the life of, uh, had came up to her, gave her a hug and told my mom that she forgave me that she knows that it was the enemy, the spirit that was in me that did it, that it wasn't me. And Chuck, throughout the next years, revival would happen at Marion Correctional Institution, uh, uh, of which I've never seen since. Um, God dealt with the, with the racial issue in my life, with the racism, brought a guy into my life, Lee Tolbert, African American, out of uh, he was grew up in the inner city of Toledo, uh, became my best friend. Became my best friend. He was he was my brother from another mother. He was uh, we were that close. And uh, in 2014, he was diagnosed with four stage uh, prostate cancer. And uh, from that point forward, I would become his uh, nurse. I would become his home health care. I would become everything that uh, the prison system isn't equipped to handle stuff like that. Uh, they usually put him in the hospital, and that's where they'll die, and, and he didn't want that. So me and my wife, my beautiful wife, would adopt him, and we would become his family. Because he hadn't seen his family in over 20 some years and he had nobody. And I promised him that he wouldn't die alone. No one should die alone. He loved Christ, he knew God, he walked humbly and strong and boldly with him. And there would come a time that. Uh, I would go down to his cell every morning at 5.30, wake him up, get him up, uh, take his adult uh, diapers off. I would clean him up. And uh, one morning I went down to do the exact same thing. And I would get down on my knee and I would be washing him up and, and he, he had to stand up and, and, and he just kind of looked down at me and shook his head and laughed. And I'm like, what are you laughing about? This is not funny. Mm -hmm. He said, man, if your Aryan brothers could see you now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. He had that. He had that life in him that, that uh, he just wanted everybody to feel the joy. He was dying, yet the joy of the Lord was in him, and that's how he lived. And uh, he, would, he would pass away 30 days before uh, he would be released. Um, in Torch, I, I spoke about Torch. In Torch, um, he would mentor young men, and these young men were so close to him and loved him so much, we would have a... Uh, a, a ceremony for him after he's passed and these young men would speak about how this older guy spoke into his life into their lives and it, it was an amazing revival at Marion and uh, man the, the things that can happen uh, there um, and can only happen with God yeah 
know that you said that um, uh, the one guy you gave the cookies to. Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, I think you told me he knew what those cookies meant. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, so I was just wondering a little bit more about that. Like, um, you know, did you have that conversation with him? How did that go? When you yeah, know? so at the, at the end of the four days of the Kairos weekend, the participants come to, come into a chapel kind of like this, and they go up on stage and they sit down. And I didn't know the guy that I gave the cookies to had just went through a Kairos weekend, so he knew what those cookies were. He knew what it meant for me to send him those cookies. So when I come in, I sit down, and, and he's sitting right there uh, in the chapel, and he's looking at me. He's like, what did I do? What I do? What did I do? I mean, he knew how, who I was, Pastor. He, he knew the violence. He knew that came, what came with, you know, being in the Aryan Brotherhood. And if, 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 if they wanted to harm you, they were going to harm you. And he knew that that bag of cookies meant I was mad enough at him or I hated him enough that I was, I was willing to harm him. And it, it was the first time that I felt bad for seeing fear in somebody's eyes. It was the first time that I looked at him and felt remorse for something that I had did. And I just, I, I, I reassured him, it's going to be okay, it's fine, I'll talk to you later. And, and we talked afterwards and um, uh, worked it out. We worked it out and uh, he's actually a good friend of mine now today. Uh, lives in Indiana, doing great with the family. Mm. Yeah. And then I also know that when we were talking, and um, I thought one of the interesting things to me is you. I know you were bringing another young guy alongside of you as well. Yeah. And um, I know that he had seen some of your. Uh, I mean, we look at you now. Don't know if you have any tattoos. Right, right, but you right. got some. <laughs> some. You had some pretty serious tattoos that um, represented one thing to you. And yeah. I know that later you. Could you explain that a little bit to us? Yeah. Now? So in torch mentoring. I was able to go into uh, the Brotherhood, the Aryan Brotherhood, or, or other gangs, or other young knuckleheads out there and, and grab hold of them. And one was in the Aryan Brotherhood, and uh, uh, I grabbed hold of him and was, wanted him to go through torch. Uh, it's kind of like a Kairos for young men. And in doing that, uh, you mentor them. So I would walk, work out with them. I walked every day with them. I would have shorts on and a workout shirt. And, and I have tattoos. And on my leg, I had um, a set of uh, bright red lightning bolts. And those bright red lightning bolts uh, mean it, it was like a prestige uh, for the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, those who had them were, were high, held to a very high standard. And every time we'd be working out, he'd look down at him and be like, man, I wish I had time to do that. I wish I'd have stayed in long enough to do that. And, and it was just, it was, it was hindering my, my mentoring. It was hindering, I felt, what God was doing in his life. So around my birthday, I decided to give myself a birthday present. Um, I decided to take those lightning bolts off of myself. Um, I would go to the carpenter shop and I would get 80 grid sandpaper and I would get the bandages. I got the AAA antibiotic lotion, I, you know, everything that you would need for a, for a wound. And I, I would uh, go into a place where I knew nobody was going to come into and I just started sanding them off. And I just started sanding them off with that 80 grid sandpaper and, and, uh, it hurt at first, and, and I just prayed over it as I was doing it. Uh, the first day I was done, I went back, cleaned it up, took care of it, woke up the next morning, the lightning bolts were back. I went back to the same place with a fresh, fresh piece of 80-grid sandpaper and was doing the same thing. Did the same thing that night, woke up the third day. They were still there. Um, went back. Sanded, I probably sanded about an eighth of an inch of my leg off. Um, it, uh, it ended up getting infected. I ended up getting um, uh, cellulitis, which is an infection up under the skin. Uh, they took me to the hospital. I uh, 
ended up being on a drip IV for uh, seven days to ten days. I forget which, what, which it was. Uh, my wife was very angry with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but I felt that conviction. When, when you believe something so much, when you believe that Christ really died, when you believe that Christ was really raised, when you believe that he's, uh, he's real in your life, you're willing to do whatever you have to to make him real in somebody else's life. And that's what it was for me, Pastor. Mm -hmm. I needed to make sure that that young man knew that Christ was real mm -hmm. in my life. Amen. Amen. I, um, part of my final question for you is, and as we're celebrating um, this season of Easter, what does, the, what does the cross and the resurrection, what does that mean for you? Or if you had to explain to somebody else who was sitting out there and they're, they're listening to their story and they're saying... I mean, is that guy real? Is that, you know, that really happened? Is it, um, man, did that transformation really take place? And, and uh, you know, and then they're looking at their own life and saying, can, can Christ do the same thing for me? I mean, what, what would you say to somebody? It's a miracle I sit in front of you. It's a miracle. By the world's standards, I should have died in prison. By the world's standards, I should have never been released. I should have died there, rotted, and, and the story was over. What the cross and the resurrection means for me is new life. It's fresh. It's, it's like a, a heart transplant. And God gave me a new heart. And with a new heart, there's a new responsibility to whom much is given, much is expected. And I know the forgiveness that was given to me. I know the garbage and the things that I did in my life. And no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what darkness lives there, or, or what the enemy is saying in your mind, or, or whatever you're going through, whether you're the criminal or the victim, the enemy will work the same in both. Mm. But the greatness part about that, you know, the enemy comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Mm. That's it. So if he's stealing your joy, if he's killing relationships around you, if he's destroying your life, man, lean on the, on the second part of that verse. Christ says that I come, that you have life and have it abundantly. Mm. And it's in that, accepting him into your heart, knowing that he lives, that he reigns, and that he will ever be the Prince of Peace. That whatever you need in your life, he will be and he will give you whatever you need, need the forgiveness, the love, the tranquility, the, he will restore relationships. He will, he will restore your life. He's restored my life tenfold. Once again, thanks for listening. If you are in the Marion area, we would love to engage with you at one of our Sunday morning gatherings. For directions, service times, and information about our fantastic children and student ministries, visit us at dayspringwesleyan.org. That's dayspringwesleyan.org.